good evening good evening hi Catherine hi hi everybody just so everyone knows Catherine is there we just can't see her face we it doesn't see. help either yeah it doesn't really help either that I'm also down as Siobhan <laughs> so oh, yeah. we're not we're not really you know making it easy for anybody to, uh, to actually get what's going on it's not Siobhan and you can't see me but brilliant uh, <laughs> how's your day been uh, yeah, just, it's not been too bad actually. I've been off today, so it's been quite nice. I've been doing DIY, which, um, although I did, uh, it's quite funny actually, I did the, um, I cartered the path yesterday. Nice. Oh my word, it's just a bit like being at work. Satisfying thing ever, isn't it? It was amazing. It was just like, I just thought, oh my God, I feel like I'm at work. <laughs> Jet washing, air polishing. <laughs> I say that's for patients as well. Um, oh yeah, this is just like a cartridge for your mouth. <laughs> right. Yes. We're just letting a few people come in. I know that it's a bit later, isn't it, than normal? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's my fault that it's late. It's just I work late on a Thursday, so. And then we are. I I've had a few technical issues. Um, I've. I, it's a good job. Like I've just had to. It's a good job I live with numerous children who've all got laptops because we're now on on um last daughter's laptop <laughs> so <laughs> fingers crossed you can hear me all the way through even if you can't see me well, not that you need to hear me you need to hear cat don't you um i will say if anyone's got any questions or anything to pop it into the q and a rather than the chat box because i'll lose mm -hmm. them so um yeah. make, make sure you can pop your questions into the q and a yeah, that's great. I will tell you now that um, the session is being recorded and that it should be up on the uh, MyNSK website in about 10 days or so. So um, just from hang fire um, and um, it should be up there. You will get your um, feedback via email um, in around sort of three, four days maybe we're on Thursday now so probably Monday or Tuesday before you receive that if you fill that in and pop it back to um the email address you will get your um, certificate for tonight um as Kat said um we are going to hopefully have some questions at the end uh, we'll get started because um, we're on 8.03 and I'm sure Kat's got a lot to say about competence, competence, uh, composite maintenance even. Um, she is um, probably needs no introduction. I'm sure you all know who Kat is. <laughs> um, she's a dental therapist who has, is on a mission to, um, to make sure that every dental practice um, in the land who wants to use a therapist um, and utilise them in, in, you know, full scope of practice is going to do so. And she does a lot of composite. Um, so, again, like I say, don't need to really go any further with the introductions. And I will um, hand you over to Kat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and put your feet up now, Catherine. <laughs> God, yeah, I think I need whiskey, not even gin. You whiskey. work hard enough. You can just put your feet up now. Thank you. You've watched the drive. You've done the introduction. So <laughs> you can relax. Thank you. So, good evening, everyone. I have got coffee and water. So, you know, whichever one I pick up, you know how, how the evening's going. Um, <laughs> It's been a really, really long day um, at clinic. We've got dentist off sick at the moment. So I'm covering the dentist diary and my own diary at the moment. So apologies if I trip over my words a little bit. Um, but I am so excited that we get to talk about composite maintenance. It's something that, you know, we are all having to face, hygienists and therapists. We are all having to face this um, composite maintenance uh, issue at the moment and we have been for, for a number of years now so um all all tonight is about really is running you through the protocols that I use um when a patient turns up and they've got you know composites that are needing some some kind of oral hygiene some kind of maintenance some kind of work um so I really hope this is useful um, for those of you that have tuned in, thank you so much um, for, for coming and joining me late on a Thursday. I hope you've all had a really good day um, as well. 
So thank you for joining me. Um, I really think it's important that we understand how to look after composites. Um, and I wanna just talk you through, um, like I say, the way that I do it. So the aim today is to take an in-depth look at how dental hygienists and dental therapists can employ modern techniques to maintain composite restorations. So we're going to have a look at key equipment choices, um, also treatment protocols to support gold standard patient care. And that's what we're all here for, isn't it? Just to make, be the best we can be for our patients' sakes. Um, so lots of research papers involved in this um, presentation today. Um, obviously this will be recorded and, and it will be um, uploaded to the My um, NSK website. So the Ikigai portal on there has all the webinars recorded. Um, and that's so you can go back and, and you can share the, the webinars as well with people who you felt maybe could do with it or has miss, have missed out and wanted to know more. Um, and then we've got some objectives today. So what we're going to try to achieve, um, and that is to describe the growing need for awareness around composite maintenance, um, explain the indications for different composite maintenance techniques and equipment. So when would you use them? Um, demonstrate those techniques, uh, what, what, what uh, specific techniques are required for specific equipment. And also to talk about what are our communication goals when we're treating our patients? What, what do we want our patients to fully appreciate and understand when we're treating them? And I will touch on that throughout um, this webinar this evening, but I really do encourage questions. Um, obviously, uh, you know, maintaining restorative um, uh, situations in patients' mouths is not a one-stop shop. And it's also, you know, very subjective. Um, how you do it may be different to how I do um, and also how your dentists do it. And, and equally how your the dentist that placed the restorations or the therapist that placed the restorations wants them maintained. Um, so this is something that we need to really look at today um, in detail. So. Um, so yeah, please do sort of pop your questions in the in the Q and A, and also feel free to contact me. I know that after a, um, always after I've done a webinar, I will get you know ten to twenty people who, uh, who pop in and, and give me a DM and say like, oh, you know, um, I, I didn't feel comfortable asking the question online in case you read it out. <laughs> but but can you tell me X, Y, and Z? So please feel free to pop me a message anytime. I'm more than happy to help. Yes. If I when I feel like time, I'm trying to fly high, but I'm not a client. And I have so many things I'm getting out of the product of the system where you look at it. So when you type composite bonding into any search bar, any search term, you are bombarded with images of what we have come to see call or I've come to call Instagram teeth, beautiful, white, straight, bonded, shiny, stunning, composite bonding, uh, also known as teeth bonding, also known as edge bonding, composite restorations, um, composite veneers. And if you have a look at Google Analytics, um, and you have a look at the search term composite bonding, which is what you can see in front of you there. Look at that crazy growth in how many people searched for the term composite bonding. And then obviously on top of that is all the other terms that patients call it. So we might call it composite bonding, but patients call it teeth bonding, edge bonding, veneers, composite veneers, um, you know, all sorts of things. So, so the growth in composite bonding has been crazy. And um, I can tell you that that big spike that you can see there is um, April 2021. So I had to think then, I was like, really, was it? Yes, 
April 2021 was the biggest spike in interest on uh, Google for the search term composite bonding. Can anyone think why April 2021 might be um, the, the main time? Well, I can tell you from, um, from my own research that it was the Zoom phenomena. So obviously 2020, we got shut down, but everyone talks about this every time. Like the pandemic is the best conversation you can have with people, right? So 2020, we got shut down, everyone went online, even Kiki Guy went online and, um, and staff members went online. So my husband started working from home. I'm sure a lot of other people, non-clinical, um, also started working from home and we start seeing ourselves on Zoom, right? We start, not only are we seeing ourselves speaking, talking, smiling, which is something that we perhaps wouldn't normally have done, but other people are seeing us as well. And we're seeing them see us. Um, and so that's why this huge spike, April, 2021. So we're coming out of lockdown. We've had two by then. Um, April is the end of the tax year, right? Everyone gets their bonuses at that time, all the corporate, um, you know, high flyers, all the big, the big wigs that get bonuses, they get them around about April time, generally speaking. So you see this huge spike in interest. And what drives that spike is maybe Zoom, but also people like this. Okay. So <laughs> oh love them. Rylan, Molly May. Okay, so Ryland very famously had composite bonding um, on his teeth. They, they were, we saw Ryland um, first in, um, what was it? Was it, it, was, it wasn't X Factor, was it? It was um, Britain's Got Talent. I think it was Britain's Got Talent we saw Ryland in first. And he auditioned when he was sort of like 19 and he didn't have anything on his teeth. And then as time passed, we've seen him on TV ever since. And we've seen his teeth change numbers of, a number of times. And the same with Molly May. So Molly May started on Love Island. Um, she came in as the sort of blonde bombshell and she had her bonded teeth already um, on Lo Love Island. It became really, really, really popular. I remember watching that and thinking, hmm, I think, has she got Invisalign? Um, but she definitely had something on her teeth at that time. And then very famously, um, Molly May has decided to have her lip fillers dissolved, her cheek fillers dissolved. Um, she decided to have her bonding removed and then replaced. So Rue Dental in Manchester removed and replaced her bonding. So she still doesn't have her natural teeth. She still has some bonding. It's just done in a different way, done naturally. So this is the one of the reasons why composite bonding or anterior bonding or cosmetic bonding or edge bonding, whatever you want to call it, it has become really popular because it's been spoken about so much at the same time as people having money because they were locked down and still earning and then gaining some self-awareness and some self-consciousness. So we saw this huge boom in dentistry around cosmetic and you will have noticed a lot of dentists and dental therapists are providing composite bonding. Even me. <laughs> and although, um, you know, I don't, don't talk about my anterior work very much because I have to say I, it doesn't fit in with a business model for me. Posteriors is where it's at for me. Um, but I do do anterior composite bonding. I love doing it for the right reasons, for the right people. So um, this is Laura and um, she's one of those really typical patients who, um, you know, I've been seeing her for ages and ages and ages and we've been talking about getting her teeth straightened having Invisalign, you know, now's the time, when are you going to do it? It's time to do it. Your gums are healthy now, your teeth are healthy now, you know, all of that. And uh, and I remember her coming in and saying to me, Pat, I am so ready now. I'm so ready. I want to get my teeth straightened. I've, I'm going to get married and I want them straight for my, my wedding. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. It's time. Let's do it. Let's send you to the dentist. Let's get you sorted. Let's get you scanned. And uh, yeah, I said, well, when's the wedding? She was like, in three months time. <laughs> Oh, well, then we're not going to stray in them in time for your wedding. So this was one of those ideal situations where we could just make improvements with some composite bonding in a temporary way um, and just get the teeth looking lovely and shiny and sparkly.
um, for her wedding. And then sadly, they've already been removed because she is now having her teeth straightened. But there we go. Um, it's what that this is one of the reasons that patients love composite is that it feels very minimally invasive, although it's not without damage to enamel ever because we have to etch and also removing composite is very difficult without if you if you want to remove composite bonding it's hard to do so without damaging enamel um uh but it does feel very minimally invasive it doesn't it doesn't feel as permanent as porcelain however composite bonding is not without its downsides and there are loads of us churning out lovely photos like this but there aren't so many people showing this kind of picture of what happens when it gets old, um, what happens when um, the patients don't maintain it or the clinicians don't maintain it or if it's done in an incorrect way. Um, and we have either mechanical retentive failures um, or which is what we've got chipping you can see on the side here so that is not a retentive failure it's more of an occlusive failure or we might have cosmetic failures so often if the margins aren't um, infinity margins that finish you can see uh, the way I took the photograph um, on that central incisor if you look if you look flat on it looks really lovely so the way the patient was looking at it it looked really lovely but if you look slightly from the lateral view you can see, and with this light refraction, you can see the margin is very rough. The composite is chipped. It was also very stained. So it was a, a bit of a failure, even though the patient wasn't noticing it. And that's down to a placement failure. So the, the um, edge bonding wasn't perhaps brought high up enough the tooth. Probably the wrong composite choice as well, which we'll talk about today. And also the patient wasn't aware of how to maintain. So she'd actually chipped it um eating I can't remember what it was now I think it was something hard like a a carrot stick something like that that she'd actually chipped it with so really important that we understand that this sort of thing is what we get in our surgeries when we're the person providing the maintenance the hygienist the therapist doing hygiene um, is going to come across this kind of mechanical cosmetic um failure and bonding failure um, on a regular basis. So what are we going to do about it? How are we going to maintain these patients? Well, the first thing is understanding composite. So I won't go into it too much because ultimately I feel like if you're the person placing the composite, then that's when you really need to go into the mechanic, the understanding of the type of composite. But for the majority of us, 90% of hygienists and therapists are going to be the ones maintaining the composites. You know, our bread and butter, our day-to-day -day patients. I, I had a couple today in uh, direct access, patients come in off the street for a hygiene clean and you're like, mm, there's stains all over these buckle, buckle restorations. They're the worst, right? Clark stain, terrible margins. But we do need to understand composite in order to understand how to maintain it. So Composite resins have a number of different components and there are a number of different ways they can be put together to provide us with different resulting types of composite. They always have a, a substrate, a matrix that, that all these things sit in. They've got filler components, which are chunky little bit, bits of, um, you know, um, silica composite, um, which are the main thing that provides strength Fillers provide strength and the, and generally cut a lot of the color. You have a coupling agent that holds everything to it together. Initiators and accelerators are what will start the bonding process. Um, and then pigments, obviously, to, to give us the right color for the tooth that, um, that we're restoring. And then when it comes to thinking about how durable those composites are, it's really very much about those fillers. So small particles, small filler particles, if you think about sand, small filler particles, you're able to pack that sand into a bucket, create a really smooth sand castle, right? If you, if you think of a small filler size, pack that in, you can, make, you can make it really smooth on the outside. If it is stones and you've got larger particles, then you can pack that into a bucket all you like, but it's never gonna have a smooth edge. 
okay it will always be rough which means it's also harder to polish the surface will be rough, rougher but generally speaking more filler um, and larger particle sizes can be more give you more strength um, low filler content means that there's less strength so you do want there to be some strength in your composite but obviously on anteriors, if we're talking anterior composite veneers, they don't need to withstand as much occlusal force as the posteriors would need to. So anterior restorations, generally speaking, you would use a, a composite that has small filler sizes and less, maybe a slightly lower filler content. I'm really sorry if, if you guys can hear my husband's car alarm going off. <laughs> Soon he'll notice and then realize that I've, pro I've probably left it unlocked. <laughs> so composite resins have changed over the years um, and we started with macro fill. So these huge filler particles, they're huge stones, right? Um, and they were um, really ugly looking composites. You'll notice patients that have really old composites, they may be still macro fill style composites, super ugly, very difficult to polish, difficult to get a good color match. They never look shiny, they're always matte. Um, nowadays, we've moved all the way through to using um, a lot of people still use micro hybrid composites for their posteriors. Um, then we, we saw in the 2000s, we saw nanofill composites come out. So this is just one type of um, filler particle, just one type in there. Um, and they were really good. Nanofill were always considered the, some of the best for polishing, but no strength. And so now we, we majority of us are using nano hybrids and nano hybrids because there's lots of little bits around those bigger strength providing filler particles, you get that polish ability. Um, and it's nice because, you know, it, you know, you've got strength with that composite, but you're going to get this beautiful gleaming shine on it as well. So, as I said, unless you're placing them, it's not such a big concern. But if you are up against a composite that just never looks nice, even though you, you know, you're, you're doing all the right things for maintenance, it may be either it needs specialist polishing or it's the wrong composite choice. Um, so as I say, nano hybrid composites, they are the ones that offer a bit more durability. Um, they don't tend to shrink. They polish easier. They're easy to handle. They look nicer. So those are the ones that I personally choose to use at the moment. This is what it looks like if you choose the wrong composite. So this is a number of things have happened with this poor patient that came in to see me. And I can tell you, although this bonding looks old and worn, it had only been done about six months beforehand. So that can, you can tell from that, it had um, a poor finishing protocol. If you look at the upper right one, um, it's got a really matte surface. Um, it's got poor finishing protocol. Um, you can see that the, the dentist or the therapist that placed this, actually I can tell you it was a dentist because it was not placed in this country. Um, so the dentist that placed this just didn't spend long enough making that composite um, smooth and finished. Um, also, there is a potential chance it wasn't cured long enough as well, because obviously if we don't polymerize that composite um, enough, it still remains slightly sticky in a way and it will take up stain a little bit. Um, and so it means that it's difficult to polish, it's, it's difficult to maintain um, polish and it picks up stain. So these composites, because it's the wrong type of composite with a poor finishing protocol, it's really high risk for staining. So no matter what we do, when we remove the stains and the patient is really good with their oral hygiene, the stains will come back because it's almost impossible when it's a poor composite choice for us to keep it looking really lovely and really healthy. So the key things when it comes to maintaining um, anterior restorations, so those that we, you know, that we um, can see and they should remain aesthetic as well as functional is that Ideally, patients who have anterior restorations should be told excellent oral hygiene regime 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 um, 
a polish or refinish every six to 12 months. So composites are not foolproof. They will lose their gleam, their shine, and they will need to be refinished on a regular basis. And also the dentist that provides the bonding or the therapist that provides the bonding when they, they should work with the dentist to ensure that patients wear a nighttime splint. Grinding, clenching, abfraction, all of these things can have an effect on the bond, on chipping, on wear, but also micro fractures in the surface of composite. So it's really helpful to have um, a retainer or a mouth guard worn. So anytime we have composite bonding um, patients, they are given maintenance advice before they leave the surgery with their bonding. It's really important that they agree to maintenance advice and guidelines. And so this is a, an example for you of some of the guidelines that we give them. So this is for, for the patient, right? So not what we're doing, but this is for the patient. Good oral hygiene, regular flossing, a good diet and lifestyle. So it's avoiding things that stain like tea, coffee, curry, I always say be true, <laughs> don't know why, um, um, not smoking, trying not to eat hard foods or at least small, cutting them up into smaller pieces they don't bite with the teeth that are bonded with, avoid using teeth as tools, so nail biting, biting strings, opening bottles, how many of us have patients that have done that, having regular checkups, professional hygiene appointments, making sure that if they notice a chip, they come and see us, or a crack, they come and see us. Um, and also obviously using a night guard and avoiding abrasive products because composite is much softer than porcelain. So where we've, all of us older, that's me, hygienists and therapists are used to patients having porcelain veneers. Now we're seeing a bigger trend for composite and composite is just far softer. No matter what composite you use, it's far softer. And so we need to ensure that our patients are using a low RDA, low relative dentine abrasivity toothpaste. And ideally they need to be sticking in the low to medium range. So that's the blue to green chart here. So things like um, Colgate sensitive, um, Sensodyne Cool, Aquafresh Sensitive, those sort of gen more gentle toothpastes. Um, but, um, some charcoal toothpastes you see that I've written there can be as high as 166 on the RDA scale. So really, you know, even though patients are being marketed these toothpastes as stain removers, that doesn't mean that they're going to maintain the composite and keep them away from stain or staining uh, susceptibility. So what options do we have? What can we do for our patients when they do come in with stained composites? Um, well, you know, we can take a stone, we can take a burr to that composite, or we can use our traditional ultrasonic air polish uh, method. And I want to talk you through all of those in some detail today, because when a patient comes into you, I want you to be able to look at the situation that you're presented with and think, what is the least, the minimally, most minimally invasive thing that I can do to make sure this patient leaves my surgery happy, healthy, and knowing what maintenance has been done and what they need to do to, to continue this and, and make sure that they don't need to, you know, um, come back basically too soon. I always say to my patients, my job as a hygienist is to get you to the point where you don't need a hygienist <laughs> because ideally I want them to be able to do the prevention all on their own, which would be great, right? So the first thing is um, actually, and you might find it um, unusual that I'm saying it, but the first thing is thinking about your ultrasonic. Now an ultrasonic is pretty much in it, the hands of every hygienist nowadays. Um, and it, it might be come as a surprise to you, but an ultrasonic can be less invasive than a lot of air polish, um, powders, especially on composite. Now, really important if you're going to ultrasonic around a composite, that you fully appreciate how to use that ultrasonic because on piezo, um, the, only the lateral sides are active are the sides that you want to be using. If you were using the um, back or the tip of that scalar, you're likely to cause damage to the composite. 
So if you are needing to remove calculus or heavy stains using a, an ultrasonic, really important that we're using just the lateral side so it's much less invasive um, and we adapt that um, ultrasonic to the tooth surface as minimally invasively as we possibly can. I personally, if I've got a composite that really, you know, maybe it's got that, you know, that sticky plaque around it um, that's not coming off with a more minimally invasive procedure with air, such as um, air polishing, which we'll go into in a bit, then I personally pick up a perio ultrasonic. Some people use peak tips. I personally quite like a perio ultrasonic um, because it's fully rounded. Um, this is more of a long, fine maintenance tip. It's only really removing that sticky biofilm, that um, that sort of stain, and it's less likely to cause any damage to composites. I have it on really low settings and just sweep around margins. I won't use this for full surface cleaning or maintenance on composites. It would just be for around gingival margins. So for instance, when you've got those buckle restorative um, composites where patients have had maybe wear restored, um, these can be really good because you can just get subgingively slightly and remove any biofilm um, around those areas. So really, really worth considering um, whether you could use ultrasonic the next option is to think about air polishing um, because air polishing, as we know, is very minimally invasive and also extremely effective. And obviously we know it's a jet of air, powder and water that combine to remove stains and biofilm. But what's really important is that we know what powders are we using. And I know if you've done my air polishing webinar before, you will um, have heard this a thousand times from me that powder is the most important thing to think about when you're using your air polishing machine. You need to make sure you're using the right powder for the situation. You need to make sure that you're using the right powder for the equipment. And you also need to make sure you're using the right powder for the patient. So if you've not done my air polishing webinar yet, then it's on, it's recorded on um, the Hikai website. Really recommend going and having a look at that. But we will go into some detail today just about what works for composites as well. Here, this is a, a video of calcium carbonate powder removing some anterior staining um, uh, very slowly because we all love a slow-mo, don't we? <laughs> um, and air polishing can be really helpful for the maintenance of composites. Be aware, because the air and water um, don't combine with the powder until it's out of the tip, if you get too close to a tip of air polish, then you'll be getting just powder hitting your composite, and it's going to cause more damage than if it was combined with water. Okay, so we must be aware of how um, far away from the tip the air, water, and powder combine. On an NSK um, handpiece, it's usually around three millimeters away from the tip, that's your safe zone. If you get too much closer than that, then you can be um, just hitting neat powder onto the composite surface, and that can cause more damage and create the, the uh, effect of the composite looking more matte. So what powders should we use for composite? Well, we, we talk about the Mons hardness scale, and this is a qualitative scale from one to 10, just talking about how hard things are. So ideally we wanna be as low on that scale as possible when it comes to using our composite. And I have to say thank you to Catherine and Jenny for this um, lovely flow chart, which talks about what kind of powders you use in what situation. Um, and, and it breaks the powders up into powder for supra gingival, powder for sub gingival. And sub gingival powders typically are your organic glycine, your erythritol, or your tagatose. So most uh, air polish providers, air polish device providers or manufacturers who use a, uh, a small particle powder for sub gingival cleaning will use one of those. Um, glycine, erythritol, or tagatose. Um, and those are the ones that really we want to be re relying on for our composite maintenance. Um, the evidence is telling us that we must maintain restorations 
um, in order to stop plaque stagnation, um, in order to reduce um, biofilm buildup. Um, but they also say that the amount of damage that is um, sustained by composite is very much dependent on the material that you use. So the material, the type of composite that's used um, and also the type of maintenance protocol that you use. And so we found that sodium bicarbonate has a much stronger detrimental effect on composite surfaces than glycine or erythritol, the, the um, or more organic subgingival dissolving smaller powder particles that are lower on the Mons hardness scale. So around two on the Mons hardness scale. Um, and it was found that because they've got small particles and they're not very hard, they don't tend to damage the composite as much. Um, and the low one, one study shows that the lowest roughening of composite surfaces tested was obtained by air polishing with glycine powder for five seconds. So just to wrap that up, that research up for you, the extent of damage to composite surfaces um, is more with sodium bicarbonate, calcium carbonate powder therapy, your aluminum, aluminum um, trihydroxides as well. Those ones are larger particle powders that are much more likely to damage the surface of composite. You will see a difference when you use these powders to the composite surface, you'll see a difference. Then the next most minimally invasive thing is ultrasonic scaling. And then the most minimally invasive thing would be powder therapy or air polishing with your glycine, erythritol, or tagatose when they're small particle powders, okay? So ideally you want to be sticking to using a glycine powder. Uh, the research generally points towards using a glycine powder such as um, perimate powder, which is the one that I use. This is an organic amino acid. It dissolves in water, so it's highly water soluble, very small micron size of 23 um, and very low on the hardness scale. So it's a similar hardness to dentine, which, you know, will tell you that it's, um, you know, it's much less likely to cause any damage on composite surfaces. So you can use it on any restorative surface. Now, these subgingival glycine powders can be used for stain removal. You can see me using um, that glycine powder here for these stains. Now, I would say generally you're looking for immature staining um, on your composite. So if, it, if it's stained with immature um, stain, it's not been there for ages. It's not super hard like smoking stain. This stain was more of a dietary, actually I think from memory, this patient was taking um, iron, liquid iron. And that's why we had these stains and they came off really nicely with the glycine powder, but you need the right equipment. It needs to be quite powerful and you can have that power quite high when you're re removing um, this type of stain from composites. And it's not gonna cause a problem because you've got the right type powder, the small particle size powder. The technique when you're using that small um, glycine powder is like I say, said before, trying to stick to three to five millimeters away from the tooth surface. So. Obviously, if you get too close, you may not be getting the effect of the water power in with the powder. Um, working in a circular motion, but you can angle it in any way when it comes to using a subgingival powder like glycine or erythritol or tagatose. However, there's a hun over 100 of you online this evening, and I bet you're thinking, yeah, all right, Kat, you work in like the easiest practice in the world. I do, I genuinely do. I've got the nicest patients. They all come in with clean teeth. Um, <laughs> um, but we work where patients come in with heavy stains. They do smoke. They don't listen to advice. Their composites are chipped already. And as a hygienist or as a therapist maintaining these, um, what am I going to do? What about heavy stains? Um, and the fact is you may not know where those composites have been placed. You may not know what material that composite is made out of, how old it is. Um, all you know is that patient does not want to be leaving your surgery with that stain, right? Am I right? Um, so what are you gonna do about heavy staining? And I do think we have to be realistic here. Um, if I was to say, 
you know, heavy stains, send them back to the dentist that did the composite or, uh, you know, um, they're not going to, the patients are not going to be happy. So we do need to know a protocol for managing this situation. What are we going to do about these heavy stains? Well, I will tell you that actually the glycine powder that I showed you before, it does work. It does work on heavy stains, but I mean, we can, we all love a video, uh, especially a stain removing video, but it can take a bit of time. These are composites, by the way, there are composites under this um, staining. And this is real time, um, me with my glycine powder, removing those stains and looking for where the composites are. This is the other thing, isn't it? Because we don't always know that there's composite under the stain. We don't always see it straight away. I'm, I don't see it. A lot of clinicians that I work with don't see them until they've had a clean and we find them. So yes, glycine powder does work. It takes a long time. If you're pushed for time or if it's not working for you, if you don't have the right equipment, it may be that we need to think about another approach. So what we once did or what I once did um, and, and um, you know, before I had my air polishing equipment, I would have used a profi paste and it's okay it's absolutely fine to use a profi paste to remove stains. What you want to do is look for the lowest relative dentine abrasivity possible, okay? As low as possible, because obviously the higher the grit level, the more likely it is to decrease the surface gloss and therefore increase roughness of your composites, which means that patient with that stain composite is going to come back with it stained again. And that's not the point, is it? The point is that we maintain these, but also educate our patients and prevent further problems. So we do want, we can use a polishing paste. You want to be using um, uh, the lowest RDA possible and on a low speed. So around about 2000 revs per minute or revolutions per minute is probably about right for your speed for your um your slow hand piece um we quite i quite like using these webbed polishing cups because they hold the polish in the webs um and it means you get a little bit more surface contact with the um with the composite as well um but there is a new option um those of you that have done the most recent air polishing webinar with me will know that we nsk has just brought out uh, a slightly larger format glycine powder so it's still organic it's still soft but it's a larger format micron. Um, and that means that we can use that to remove those heavy stains. It's much more effective on heavy staining, um, but it will potentially still affect the surface texture of composite. So you can see um, there's, a, there's a bigger effect when you use sodium bicarbonate or an inorganic powder, but there is still an effect with glycine. It doesn't mean that there's no effect. It's just some <laughs> essentially um so if we are going to have to use larger format powders because we haven't got another option or we have to use um a polishing paste because we don't have another option and um how many of us do you know get to choose every time a patient comes in the exact perfect equipment for them um we have to remember that it may alter the composite finish Okay, so this is the soft pearl, um, same model. You can see how far I got with the glycine on the other lateral. And I have to say apologies for the, the fact that you can't see everything being done on this video. It's not easy filming and air polishing on your own. <laughs> but, you know, um, there I am. So you can see it's a lot quicker, right? It removes that stain. And um, you can just about see the lateral has got um, a composite plus four on it. Um, so it does remove that staining. It's a lot quicker, but it can alter the surface texture. Um, and so if you've had to alter the surface texture of a composite, whether that's because there's staining on it or because it might be a plaque retentive factor and you've had to remove a ledge, um, then you may need to uh, main polish, repolish or refinish the surface of your composite um, or of your patient's composite once you're finished. Okay, so just bear in mind that um, if you're going to go with something more than a really small particle of glycine powder, you're probably also going to need another step 
when it comes to adding the luster or the gloss back to that composite. Okay. So what I know a lot of people are going to be saying is, what are you talking about removing ledges? <laughs> I'm a hygienist. I don't play with composite. But just remember, it is in the scope of practice for hygienists to adjust restored surfaces in relation to periodontal treatment. So if you're providing a periodontal treatment for a patient, they have overhangs, buckle, buckle composites with ledges on them. How common are they? And it's causing plaque retentive factors. You are well within your remit if you feel trained, competent and confident to remove them. Now, because uh, Lauren Long and I run a hands-on, a full-day hands-on course, which I'll show you at the end today, about um, pow using powered tools as a dental therapist and a dental hygienist, we cover ledge removal on a hands-on course. Um, and so we did contact a lot of indemnity um, companies to just get that sort of real solid advice about removing ledges as a dental hygienist, because some people... Um, some some people had um, you know said oh I don't know because I was I don't think I've been trained um, so what they say is you must be as the GDC says trained confident trained competent and indemnified um, and so if you don't feel confident go and get yourself a hands-on course but I'm going to run through a couple of just maintenance techniques um, with you today just to whet your appetite even if you don't feel confident if you do fantastic crack on remove those um those ledges so long as the patient's happy and you've spoken to them about your reasons why and obviously any risks involved what we say is just make sure you're safe empowered with knowledge and always putting the patient first so you are trained competent and confident and sticking within the gdc rules and regs so obviously little wet, wet, wet your whistle taster on when you have composites that you may need to adjust, for instance, little overhangs like this. So when you've got well-bonded restorations, so buccal restorations, interproximal restorations, ones that are well-bonding, but they are causing inflammation or plaque retentive factors, or if you're needing to remove orthodontic cements that are causing biofilm adhesion. How many times do you have patients come in and they had braces 10 years ago and you still see attachments or you still see composite? And it's causing all sorts of problems with stains and with um, plaque tartar inflammation. Maybe the, the person removing those braces or those attachments wasn't didn't quite see that little bit. So you can remove those overhangs and those ledges when they're causing problems. Um, so make sure that if it's a restoration, it's well bonded. This is exactly what I'm talking about with um, buckle restorations. I mean, it it begs belief how it can be left like this, but you just never know the situation the clinician was in when they were placing these kind of restorations. So you can see when we started, the patient came and saw me for um, hygiene and we could see there was just tons of inflammation, overhangs galore on every tooth and um, you know this composite that was really bothering the patient. And so well-bonded, um, I was happy it wasn't going to flick off and cause me all sorts of drama um, and we could polish this down. So this is the sort of situation we're talking about if you're having to adjust. OK, now, if you've adjusted a restoration, you then are going to have to polish it. If you've cleaned it because it's covered in heavy staining or heavy calculus biofilm and it's caused you to lose the patina, you're going to have to repolish it as well. OK. Obviously, also, I have to say, <clears throat> there are times that you really want to leave adjusting restoration. So if they're not sticking well, um, if you think they're going to come out, if the overhang is deep for you, too deep for you to access without causing trauma, if there's any caries, if you're concerned, if you don't feel that you feel confident at any point, just leave that for somebody else to deal with. Okay, make a note of it and leave it. Um, ideally, we want to be using slow speed hand pieces as, as, as a rule, majority of the time, just a little bit safer and, and, um, and less likely to cause trauma. And there are a majority, a, a plethora of um, different burrs that you can use in your slow hand piece that will, um, that will be fine for adjusting restorations. I actually just really love a, a soft flex disc. Um, I'm quite old fashioned in that sense. Then I like my soft flex discs because they're very flexible. We'll talk about them in, in a little bit. 
but just be aware of how fast you're going with your slow hand piece. This is what I wanted to say is we want to make sure we're using low speeds, even when we've got the slow hand piece, make that a low speed as well. So I don't, when I'm maintaining restorations or polishing restorations, I don't tend to go above 10,000 uh, revs per minute. Okay. Um, you can, they generally go up to 40,000, um, but I tend to stick very low, especially with polishing. The lower and slower tends to be the better. Obviously be safe, safe for your patient, but also safe for yourself. So make sure you're very stable with your seating. You've got a good fulcrum um, when you're using these polishing techniques. Make sure you've got good access and you can see into the patient's mouth as well. As well. So I like to use an Optragate. <clears throat> there needs to be some sort of retraction. If you're using something that can cut um, composite, then it can also cut tissue. So um, we just need to make sure that we're, we're having really good retract retraction and fulcrums. So we finally got to polishing equipment. I'm so sorry, Catherine, I'm running a bit late. Um, so we finally got to polishing equipment. There is so many things on the markets. So I've just put a few things here that I like to use. Softlex discs we've mentioned a few times. Um, white stones are, you'll see them on most trays for de most dentists because they're often used for finishing um, composites, regardless of where they are, anterior, posterior. The wheel, polishing wheels, you can get these from many different companies. These blue ones are the Carrare ones. I also use my Zynga pink ones. Really, there's very little difference. Uh, don't tell them I said that. Um, fine polishing strips are fantastic, like Epitex are fantastic for your um, interproximal staining because you know with a composite veneer that's where the margin ends that's where the veneer stops there's an edge there's a ledge and there you might find some plaque so I always go for the finest possible epitex and then there are a number of different polishing pastes on the market as well every different polisher will give you a different result microscopically okay it's really good to understand what kind of result are you going to get and what the research says is that multi-step polishing systems, when you've got more than one step to what you're doing, you generally get the smoothest finish and therefore the best stain resistance. So as I say, this is the Meisinger um, twist polishers that I love to use. Um, they're my, <laughs> they are my favorite, not because they're gold, I promise, um, but they are my favorite. Um, and it's a multi-step polishing um, protocol. So you remember, Oh, I'm quite proud of this picture, actually. You remember the um, the model that I was air polishing earlier with glycine powder? And on, on one side, I was using um, the small organic um, glycine. On the other side, I was using the larger format organic glycine. Um, but here you can see now I've managed to remove all of the stains, but the composites themselves, which are on the laterals there, you can just about see because they're slightly the wrong color. I couldn't get like toilet white um, for them when I was placing them. Um, they um, are matte now. Okay, so I use that larger format glycine powder on them. So they're matte, they need refinishing. So what are we going to do to refinish? Well, make sure if you're using a slow hand piece, if it's, a, if it's electric motor, make sure you're using the right gear ratio. Um, uh, which is that one-to-one. -one. It will say it on the handpiece, just there. And then it will say it um, on your electric motor. Make sure that it matches your handpiece and then turn your speed right down. You wanna be um, lower than 10,000 revs per minute for these spiral polishers. And then I'm just gonna call it out. My husband was like, you can't play that video. You're not wearing gloves. It's a model. <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. Um, I'm at home as well. <laughs> who has who has a slow hand piece at home? Like, like I know, total tooth geek. Um, so this is our technique for using first the coarse spiral. So with a coarse spiral, what you want to do is you, you don't want the tooth to be wet. You're not so sopping wet, just damp. Okay, so if it's too wet, then the spiral just skips over the surface and you don't really get much of a polish. You just want it to be damp. I'm going to play that one more time for you. So you see it's got a bit of moisture on there, a bit of water on there. And then what we're going to do is actually work in a stroking motion. So I'm trying to stroke um, in one direction and then in another direction. We're trying to almost cross hatch the way you would for scaling. 
when you're trying to cross hatch. And what I would also suggest is when, especially with the more coarse of the polishers, you want to go from composite to enamel. And the reason for that is you don't want to be almost chipping the infinity edge of the composite off. You want to be smoothing the composite towards the enamel to provide a, a more infinity edge so that there's no definite ledge between where the enamel is and where the composite starts. And then we've gone down to our finer polishing spiral. So I would never do just one. You would always do both. So we start with the slightly more coarse one, which isn't coarse at all, but it's what they call coarse. And then again, feather that infinity edge off. And you can see it's become a lot more shiny with very light pressure. So you're barely touching it. And then you're just feathering towards the enamel from composite to enamel, multi-directional as well. So if you can try and go in multi multiple directions, you're more likely to get a good luster and a good shine. So that's, you can see now the difference between the side we didn't do and the side that's had that luster and that shine um, brought back to it. And let me point out as well, when a composite is really well polished, it doesn't matter as much if it's the wrong color. So this is totally the wrong color for this tooth, but you can't see it as much because it's well sh it's shiny, okay? So that reflection is really, really important for the aesthetics of the tooth as well. Now, if you don't have spirals, they are expensive. You'll probably find Softflex discs in your practice. So um, spirals, Softflex discs, you can get a similar result. Spirals are a lot quicker, but I do like the odd Softflex disc, but I will, will warn you, the first two, the coarse discs, the red and the, and the dark, the dark red and the light red are too coarse for maintenance they will change the shape of the composite. So they'll actually change the primary anatomy. Um, you, can, you can reduce the size of the composites with them, which if you've got ledges, fantastic. But if you're just maintaining, if you're just polishing, stick to the last two, but always more than one step, never just the last step, okay? Never just the middle step, always multi-step because you want to start with slightly more coarse and then polish that through and get the shine. Okay, so technique for soft flex discs, I like to flex them a little bit myself with my fingers so that they are already a bit bendy. Sometimes they're a bit hard. Um, so I do like to flex them. And with this, again, you're going from composite to enamel. Oh, I should have edited the end of that video. It made me feel a bit unwell. Um, so we're going to flex that disc. So you need to put a little bit more pressure with soft flex discs. So you need to see them bend slightly. And then you're just going to move from composite to enamel. Now with a soft flex disc as well, you can use these to go slightly into proximally, but just be wary because we don't want to be opening up contact points and stuff like that. Patients don't like that. They don't like gaps between their teeth. So we're gonna start with that medium course and then we're gonna to move to the very fine. And it's the very fine, there we go. It's the very fine that gives us a really lovely shine of that. Just like that, exactly the same, multi-directional, but you just, you can use just that little bit more pressure with a soft flex disc when it's the prime ones. Okay, but no using the others. And then if it's actually looking all, almost all right, that composite, um, and it's pretty well got its gloss, its luster and its um, shine, I would actually happily just use a composite polishing paste. Very small amount, as you can see here, on a nylon brush low speed and again you're just going to wipe that on and then give that a really good polish and you can see that luster coming back really quickly um, you can see the line angles on that composite as well and the, the shine just comes back very easily so if you're thinking if you're looking at it you're like well it's not that matte actually i've done all right and it's you know i've removed most of the i've removed all the plaque and the stains composite's looking all right just want to give that patient that little extra service then a bit of diamond polishing paste can be really helpful. <laughs> I remember one of my very first jobs when I qualified years ago now, what was it, 16 years ago? Um, they they offered a diamond polish using diamond polishing paste, pointless on enamel, but whatever, patients loved it. <laughs> and it works really well on your composites. And um, posterior composites as well, you can give them a really good polish using these goat's hair points. 
Um, so I really love goat's hair. I use these on all my composites when I'm doing posteriors. And they're great because they get into all of the little fissures in nooks and crannies. So really lovely for polishing up posterior um, composites that, you know, if you think that they've got quite stained and you've struggled to get anything um, to get the, the um, stain off, if you've gone in there with your air polish, you can get in there with a goat's hair brush just to bring the luster back again. And that will stop it from staining again. Um, you can get wheels for interiors, and I like these points for posteriors as well. So you can see the difference here between not polished, not um, not finished, not got the luster back, and the really lovely shiny one there um, that has got its luster back matches the teeth either side of it. Post-op advice would be, of course, for the patients to avoid dietary stain, to use a low relative dentine abrasivity toothpaste not smoking, especially after you've done your polishing. I think that's just a respect thing, isn't it? Um, you can also have your patients consider continuing with tooth whitening to maintain their composite color. Now, a lot of dentists will get, uh, or therapists will get their um, patients to tooth whiten before the composite bonding, but you can actually tooth whiten over the composite bonding as well. It won't change the original color of the composite at all. But composites are not as hard as porcelain, so they do uptake stain and surface stains can be bleached out of composites. So if they've got tooth whitening trays and the composites are starting to look a little bit stained, it might be worth trying some hydrogen peroxide and um, worth talking to their dentist about that for a prescription, definitely. Most importantly, and something I talk about all the time is we put the patient first. It's a patient-centered approach. So we need to make sure that they're medically suitable and clinically suitable for the treatment we're giving them. Always education comes first. Prevention is at the heart of what we do. So talking about prevention, talking about maintenance, thinking about air polishing with a system that's suitable for the patient. So if we can get away with using low, for, low um, abrasivity, organic glycine powder with a small particle size, it's not going to cause um, damage to the patina of your composites, and that's all you'll need to do. But if you are going to need to adjust or use more abrasive um, materials on the patient's restorations, you also need to discuss that with them and the fact that there will need to be further polishing or refinishing in that appointment in order to really bring the luster back, back on the tooth. If you want to, you could consider giving a composite bonding polishing consent form. I'm not a massive fan, but for some patients, it can be helpful to explain in writing what you're doing. So describing the procedure, the risks and benefits, and to obtaining some consent from the patients. It, especially if you work in a practice where there is a lot of composite bonding, happening, it could be helpful to have something like this to hand your patient just um, really to make sure the patients understand where you're coming from and what you're talking about. Some big take home messages are always, always be as minimally invasive as we possibly can. Ensure that we give our patients home care instructions to avoid those stains. It's always about prevention. Make sure they come regularly for nice hygiene appointments. Um, make sure that they know that that's a commitment. If they're having their bonding with your, you or within your practice, make sure that they make a commitment to regular hygiene visits. Ideally, air polishing with low format glycine, low, si low particle size glycine. Um, but if they are heavily stained composites you, that, that will need repolishing, get consent and um, discuss this with your patients beforehand. As I say, if you work in a practice where there's a lot of bonding going on or a lot of aesthetic composite work, it's well worth creating a protocol with the dentists or therapists that are providing that so that everyone's on the same page about how you maintain it. I chatted to one of my dentists today. She's an absolute superstar with anterior composites. One of the reasons why I don't do so much. Um, but she she's an absolute superstar. And I said, so, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking about composite maintenance and, and this is my my protocols and this is what we do in the practice. Me and the hygiene team is what we, we've discussed and what we do. Um, just double checking if I'm missing anything, you know, you know, I wanted to get your opinion. And she was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I just placed the composite. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, you know, really, really good to chat about these things because if the patients are made aware going forwards, what the commitment is going to be, they're going to be a lot more open to coming and having refinishing or repolishing with you as a hygienist or as a therapist. Um, I mentioned at the start, so if anyone's interested, you can come and see us on the 28th of September at NSK's head office in Stevenage in North London. It's a full day of hands-on powered proficiency. So knowing how to use all the powered instruments. So we go through fast, slow, ultrasonic and air polish and lots of um, composite uh, polishing techniques, but also refinishing techniques, ledge removal, um, you know, uh, maintaining areas like um, overhangs, um, removing overhangs and repolishing them. So if anyone's interested, it's a full on day of hands on and a lovely sort of like um, chat at lunchtime. One of my favorite parts of this day is we all sit down at lunchtime and troubleshoot practice problems, um, which is something that is really popular. If you made it to this point, really massive congratulations. I'm, I'm six minutes over, which I think isn't too bad. As you all know, I love to chat. Um, <laughs> You've done brilliantly there, Kat. I actually thought at one point I thought, oh gosh, we're going to be like 15 minutes over, but no, you've you brought it back. Well done. We have got um, a couple of questions. I just wanted to say, I've I've taken away. I very rarely we do quite a lot of composite bonding in, in um, practice, and I, and I um, don't really do much other than the basics. And I never really thought about tooth. I knew, I knew about toothpaste, but I never thought about recommending a toothpaste for a specific toothpaste for a patient. You know, because I suppose the patient that has composite bonding is the patient that wants the really white smile. So they're going to probably go for those toothpastes that are a little bit more abrasive. So, um, yeah, that was really good. And also, I'd like to be working your practice, please, where everybody has clean teeth. <laughs> I just, it's like unbelievable. I, I turn to my nurses sometimes and just say like, well, it, what should we do now? <laughs> really? Seriously? Honestly, you want to come and do a day in my practice? Never <laughs> do I say that. <laughs> okay. It's, it's quite rare that I do hygiene now. So I'm, I'm mainly perio or um, yeah. restorative yeah. or checkup. So, you know, the hygienists will kill me because they'll be like, it's terrible. <laughs> so um, questions wise, um, I'll start from first to, um, to last. So um, it says, hey, Kat, um, Lana here. How do you remove yellow stains around composite veneers? Thanks. I, I, this was actually really early on in the webinar, so I don't know whether, does Lana feel like that's been answered? Well, let me answer it because, okay. do you know, there, there are multiple reasons why there might be yellow stain. And so it could be that the composite veneer, the margin is not well bonded and it could be leaking right so if it's that then you have to be really careful because you don't want to get anything under that that margin unless you're ready to adjust it if you're if you think you can you can remove that ledge without the patient going mad <laughs> um then you know then you can perhaps get a very gentle um ultrasonic under there because generally that yellow stain is going to be plaque mm -hmm. but sometimes it could be the actual composite discoloring because it's not well bonded so we have to really, really dry it with 3M1, really assess the situation and be absolutely sure you know what you're dealing with before you try and deal with it. I would be quite cautious. Um, quite often those margins are discolored composite um, uh, edges that are, you know, not amazing margins. And that at that point, it's taking on quite a big job um, when you're not being paid extra for it. So if, mm. if it's that, if it's that like poor margins, you can feel underneath them, which happens a lot, then um, I would actually refer back to the dentist that placed them. Yeah, there's, I mean, I, I do get some of these and, and I really tentatively go in and just sort of think, I'll just really carefully with, with my ultrasonic and then if it just looks like it's absolutely no chance, then I just think, no, do you know what? This is not my job. You know, I'm not my job as in I'm not being. Yeah, you, know, you have to decide but, your limitations. Yeah, right? absolutely. You and know, because you, you, you end up can't, can and can't do always. It's what mm. you can't deal with if it goes wrong. Absolutely, yeah. And I feel like I'm going to cause more of a problem. Yeah. Um, you know, in in that situation. So the next question is, um, 
Is Flash Pearl a no for composite bo- uh, polishing? Composite polishing. I think, to be honest, I, I would say, yeah, it's a no now because we've got better options. So um, Flash Pearl is is more abrasive and more damaging than the larger format glycine that we've got the soft pearl. So for that reason, because we have other options and the soft pearl can be used in the same equipment as flash pearl, which is calcium carbonate from NSK, then, then really it's better to go with the glycine because that's where the research is. So I I suppose, sorry, go on. No, go on, go on, go on. I would avoid, that's what I was going to say. I think that was really interesting as well, what you um brought up about the fact that the um sodium bicarbonate and the calcium carbonate is actually more abrasive than the ultrasonic which is is really you wouldn't really think that would you at all it's yeah this is the thing and you, we have to we have to be so careful because i know that we're all we all wax lyrical about both of us do don't we about air polishing mm. being really minimally invasive yeah but you know in some situations we, we need to be careful about what where it is on the scale of minimal mm. invasivity Definitely. Okay, so I think this is in reference to when there was some orthodontic um, slide. Um, does um, that mean leftover retainer wires, composite, technically count as overhangs if patient does not want it left on, etc.? So wires, that's out of remit. I wouldn't be touching a wire. But composite that is not functionally supposed to be there that is a plaque retentive factor and causing, you know, biofilm stain or uh, buildup or inflammation is um, a plaque retentive factor. And, and that's what you, um, you are well within your remit to remove if you are trained, competent, confident and indemnified. I wouldn't be touching a wire, um, but, I, but there are often times when there's um composite you know flash left over around gingival margins and i think you know hygienists can just um flick that off for me right okay um which texture color discs are safe to use without altering the shape of the tooth surface this came in around the time you were talking about soft flex discs so that's the fine and the extra fine okay so fine and extra fine the, they will still alter the surface. Don't forget, they will still alter the surface. It's just not going to cut the shape of the tooth unless you're there for like an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, if a tooth has lost its composite bonding secondary anatomy, how do you restore it? You don't. If, <laughs> if a tooth is, if the composite bonding secondary anatomy, so by secondary anatomy, we're talking um manamelons and um you know our um uh dentine um sort of ridges and and stuff like that you can't restore that unless you're um going to start cutting into that composite with a diamond um you're not going to be able to restore the anatomy it's going to need to be removed and replaced by whoever placed it in the first place or a new clinician and the patient would would need to you know obviously being consulted for that Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what would you say do if you chip some composite during a hygiene appointment? Firstly, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always, always, always take photos of every patient that comes into my room. So as soon as I lie them back after a little chat about the weather and them and stress and we'll give them a bit of therapy, we lie them back and we take photos. I'm not touching people's teeth without that picture. Um, and it's really important to me because you can look back at those pictures if you have chipped something and think, did I was that me or was it already there? Or was it a risk factor? Was it something that was gonna happen already? Those sort of things. But essentially photos are really important. If you do chip um, someone's bonding or composite, obviously you need to say sorry. And there needs to be a protocol in practice for what's going to be done about this if you're a therapist can you replace it if you are a hygienist is there a dentist or therapist on site who's happy to work with you replacing these so make sure you have a protocol in place in the practice for what happens if a restoration fails during a hygiene appointment fantastic and do you use normal whitening for composites so 16% hydrogen peroxide um, is the carbamide peroxide, bear with me, is the one that um, I always recommend. 
if the patient isn't sensitive, but it's always down to the patient and obviously the prescribing dentist because we can't prescribe it. Is there a list of toothpaste with their corresponding RDA? Do you rub GC moves, um, GC MI paste uh, moves afterwards? Yeah, sometimes I apply I apply some type of fluoride. Uh, we have like a full range, um, and I actually like Biosmoto, which is um, from Curaprox. I really like that one. Um, it's it's vegan, so it's easy, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it tastes really nice. And yes, if you just write in toothpaste RDA list into Google, you will get tons of lists. So you'll yeah, you do, you do, yeah. Um, there's the next question is about discounts available on NSK equipment. I have no idea, but we will certainly find out for you. Whoever that anonymous attendee is, just pop an email to um, Siobhan Kelleher and she will come back to you and let you know. Um, are there any hands-on courses for hygienists to use high-speed hand paces or is this something the dentist you work with could train you in? Um, yep, yeah, come and see me in Stevenage on the 28th of September. Please feel free to book in. I will pop this um, QR code back up on the screen for anyone who's interested. Um, you really, you really, you can probably have a dentist trainee, but you need to be able to demonstrate training and competency so what I really like about going on a hands-on course is that you'll it's been quality assured you've got your um, CPD points for it you've got aims objectives outcomes um, and you'll be able to demonstrate that you've, you've done that you know that course so I, I personally would recommend a hands-on course but obviously I would I run one <laughs> <laughs> Um, how do you remove composite gingival overhangs, which burr and speed? It depends on the composites, the situation, the area, the composite, the, you know, the way the gum's looking, um, how access is. So again, this is the sort of thing that I would really recommend a hands-on course for. Um, low, always low speed, um, mm -hmm. because obviously the safer you are, the better. Um, but yeah, come and come and have a little learning experience with me um, and I'll go through that with you. But again, you know, generally speaking, fine diamonds, fine polishing, thin, small, um, easy and slow, nothing aggressive ever. Great. Um, Kat, will this course be happening up north? I really need it is newly qualified and don't feel confident with reservations. She's quite welcome to come to Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love coming to ICE <laughs> and training. Right. One of the yeah. best training institutes in England. And I travel <laughs> all over England uh, providing courses and training. And I can tell you the train to Stevenage or the Stevenage um, station is one of the most accessible stations outside of London. <laughs> um, you can get there from anywhere. Most trains take about an hour and a half from pretty much anywhere. Um, so come and join me. Hotels are cheap. To be fair, it is quite an easy drive as well. I mean, now I'm doing courses down there. And, and at first when they said Stephen, I was like, what? <laughs> Actually, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. Oh, I mean, it's, an, it's a soulless, <laughs> <laughs> soulless uh, roundabout filled um, town. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, we should say that. <laughs> Um, there's actually a lovely old town, which is great. Um, but uh, anyone that comes on that course is welcome to let me know and um, we'll go out for, for dinner that night as well. <laughs> and so um, Katie is asking about um, CPD certificates. So we'll get the questions um, finished, Katie, and then I'll explain again how to um, obtain your CPD certificate. And then somebody else is asking about recommending a cheap, um, composite bonding course and are your composite webinars on JNS Davis it's actually on NSK so it's my NSK and then if you click on um, I think it's webinars probably Ikigai and then webinars it won't be up until I think probably it's probably about 10 days until um, this one will be um, up and running on the website um, and also, if that person is asking about the JS Davies composite webinar I did a couple oh, of weeks ago, it is on demand. You can you can book into that anytime you like. 
Um, so, um, hi Kat, I'm going to put a protocol together for practice I work in. Can I use some of the information in the webinar this evening, please? Oh, yes, definitely. Why don't you, it's going to be online, it's free, open access. Why don't you sit down and show your practice and we'll all say hello now. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> hi, hi, Sharon's practice. Well done. <laughs> um, uh, definitely interested in this, in the course. Um, I which is on Ian Dunn's masterclass that day, would there uh, be day. another so time to attend? <laughs> <laughs> um, is there another day to attend? Yes, um, there's there's three dates. They're up on the screen now. So the 22nd of March in 2025, the 13th of September 2025. That feels like a long way away. But you are so organised. So <laughs> organised. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I, I need to, to take a leaf out of your book. Um, do you need specific, um, a specific hand piece such as a profimate to use glycine based powder? Can I use regular hand piece for this powder? So you need to use an air polishing device that is designed to have glycine powder in it. And whatever the manufacturer of that air polishing device is, they will have their own powder that you need to stick to because of the lumen size within the air polishing device. It may not allow the powder particles through if it's too small, or it might allow too many powder particles through if it's too big. So always stick to the powder produced by the manufacturer. Um, hi, what toothpaste would you recommend for bonding patients? Thanks. I love Sensodyne Rapid Relief for bonding patients. I use Oral-B for everyone else. Perfectly mm. patient since time rapid relief. Great. Um, with porcelain veneers, how do you remove excess cement, which is subgingival without damaging the porcelain? Porcelain. Can you use diamond tips? Um, if it's subgingival cement, you shouldn't need to use diamond tips. But again, if you're having to get to that point, then yeah, it it would be a very fine, very small diamond point. And again, on the hands-on course we will go through that so we can have a practice if you like. Just a few more. Um, Elise is saying thank you. This was so helpful. Thank you for coming uh, to all my webinars. I really appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if you accidentally join adjacent teeth during bonding, how do you separate them? You can get these tiny little saws <laughs> and um, they, I can't remember, what are they called? Contact saw. They're tiny little strips and they look like a little hacksaw. They're so scary. Don't ever let the patient see it. Um, <laughs> but you can get them in there and it will easily um, break that contact. It happens. Don't get, don't panic about it. It will eventually break apart. It's not a big deal. There's um, a company called Comet. I think they do some um, quite good ones, um, serrated saws. Yeah, I love um, them, but they are a bit too yeah. scary for patients to look at. Yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. And um, so Ashley is testing my um, my tiredness now with this um, nice long um, question. So um, thank you for a really informative webinar. I know removing overhang ledges is in our scope, but if the bonding was placed by the dentist in our practice, would it be better to send it back to them for them to tackle these? Um, and then, do you want do you want to answer that one? That first, first. Then, yeah. Yes, but in a very tactful way. Obviously, mm. you don't want to be upsetting your colleagues. So I would just be having a quiet word with the dentist saying, listen, I've got this patient. They've got a slight overhang. It's causing some inflammation. Would you like to see them to, to remove that down? Shall I send them back to you for a review? I think that's the kindest way of doing things. For those with labial inflammation due to margins, what OH measures do you advise? I always target brushing technique, review ID cleaning and techniques, but some just cannot manage improved OH due to the margins. Do you ever suggest a water pick? I know ultimately the margins need addressing. And then the, and then Ashley has apologised for a slightly long. <laughs> um, Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Um, single tufted brush, interspace tough brush, all of those without a doubt are my go-to for my maintenance. But if a patient cannot manage oral hygiene with that, uh, I would be really loath to just, you know, I mean, yes, a water pick, but I just don't think that jet of water isn't going to get up and then back down into the margin. Okay, so 
it, it, it's not going to be ideal. It's never going to be ideal. I think you have to have that conversation with the patient. And I'm going to stick my neck on the line here. Can we stop recording? Oh my God. I'm going to stick my neck on the line. Here. If you're working in a practice where the bonding is that bad that you've got all these patients with margins that are really bad, I would just jump ship. I think I'd be like, I can't do this. I can't be complicit in this. You need to have a conversation with the person placing the bonding. Like this isn't good enough. It's not ideal for the patients and I'm having to maintain it. It's not looking good. So I think I would just be really, really cautious about being complicit in, in that happening regularly. Maybe it's not, maybe I've misunderstood, um, but just be aware that, you know, it's not nice for, for you as a clinician to have to constantly bear the pressure of another clinician's work being poor. I think that's really important because I think that unfortunately because of the boom of um, composite bonding people have a, a very strange idea um, well maybe it's not strange maybe it's it's the impression that they're giving that it's actually much more um, there's much more longevity in it than there actually is I mean when I first qualified 30 years ago we used to use composite bonding to show people what a porcelain um, veneer would look, would look like. like yeah and then take the bonding off you know <laughs> so I think that it, it, you know there's probably a lot of miscommunication there and then you're getting the brunt of it as a, as a hygienist or therapist in terms of you know well let's get the stain off but it's not always that easy no it really isn't and I think we do bear the brunt a lot mm. in our profession of art uh, from other clinicians and you know we, we need to know when when enough is enough really yeah I mean that chat first is, is always a good one isn't it um so can NSK soft be used um with other air polishing systems um, check with the manufacturers of those air polishing systems. They'll probably say no, um, but check with them and see what they have to say. So along the same lines, um, can you use aluminium trihydroxide in profumate? If not, which cheap intraoral sandblaster do you recommend for air abrasion before bonding? So I don't recommend cheap ones because they're unreliable and difficult. I'm going to sneeze. I can feel it coming. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's gone. Never happens when you say it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said it. Um, so I don't recommend cheap ones. I use AquaCut, which is not cheap. It's about £4,000. The whole practice uses it. Um, the reason we do that, we like that, is because with the not only with the sandblasting with the aluminium to prep before bonding does it prep really well but it also has ethanol in the water which cleans really well make sure you've got a biofilm free zone for you to bond to which reduces your chance of failure at that infinity edge you want to make sure there's absolutely zero biofilm when you're bonding because etch doesn't get rid of biofilm and that's a misconception that a lot of people have that you can etch and it will clean the surface. It doesn't, it doesn't remove biofilm. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't like using any of the cheap sandblasters and a lot of people do get them off eBay. I just find them unreliable. Mm. And definitely not in a pro for me. No, <laughs> you'll ruin it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, cat, there's, there's just a few more. Are you okay, Kat? So, yeah. So yeah. Are you okay. all right? um so um do you recommend um glycerin for composites like um as in in KHL? yeah i get my glycerin we get our glycerin as a food grade glycerin from a, a catering shop mm -hmm. um you can actually get small bottles of glycerin from waitrose in the in the um, bakery aisle in the the home baking aisle um and glycerin essentially is a food grade clear jelly that you can cure through. And the reason people like using that is that um, oxygen stops composites from curing completely. So the bit of the composite that touches the air won't cure regardless of how much you cure with the light. And so that means it's tacky and sticky and it can pick up stains if you don't finish it, polish it away properly. So a lot of people place glycerin at the final cure. So they cure the composite, then they place glycerin. It's clear, but it stops oxygen touching. You cure through that and the composite becomes harder or more cured. And so, yes, if you're placing bonding, then I definitely always recommend, I do it for posteriors as well. Actually, my nurse does it. They love being involved. Um, place the glycerin, do a final cure, really good 20 to 30 seconds. 
and then remove the glycerin and do your polishing. It just speeds up the finishing process as well because it's less tacky and sticky. Brilliant. Um, so, Sarah, yes, um, you will be able to um, watch this back. It will be about 10 days before it goes up on the NSK, um, my NSK web um, page. Um, so just watch out for that. Um, are hygiene is allowed to use a fast handpiece? There's nothing in the scope of practice for any clinician that talks about what equipment they can use. It only talks about what they can do. Um, so for instance, if you look in your scope of practice, it won't tell you that you can use an air polisher um, or a slow handpiece. It will tell you that you can remove biofilm, remove overhangs. So it's whatever equipment you are trained, competent, confident with to do the job at hand. So that's why I'm, I, uh, Lauren and I decided to put this course together because um, a, lot of, a lot of hygienists were saying to us, well, I don't really very, feel very confident. So we wanted to change that. I think that's because we weren't trained. I mean, when we were taught, I was taught to um, um, to deal with overhangs, but with softlex discs. Yeah. So we were slow hand, hand pieces, slow, soft like discs. So I think it's a bit alien to us to think we can use a fast hand piece. And I don't think I would. I, I, I'm a bit scared. No, that's the thing. And, and you have to feel confident. And mm. if you don't, then don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah, There's definitely. And I, I would. Things that I don't do because I'm mm. like, I'm, uh, it's not for me <laughs> yeah yeah that's fair enough um, um, any chance yeah. sorry any chance are you coming of you going to northern ireland for a course always <laughs> always get enough people together is yeah. um, as long as there's 10 to 15 people that want me there i'm there <laughs> um do you think hygienists will be able to do composite bonding at some point in the future never say never Never say never. I'm really confident that the scope of practice will expand for everyone because it's so old and um, it's so out of date now. 2013 was the last update and it doesn't mention so much stuff that happens in dentistry nowadays. Mm -hmm. So let's see, watch this space. Wouldn't it be fantastic? I really mm -hmm. think a therapist is going to be able to do um, on lays and inlays soon as well. That's I'm manifesting that one. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> um any composite bonding courses you would recommend oh there's tons there's loads they're everywhere um and i actually think it is a really bad idea to go on a composite bonding course without really having a very good understanding of occlusion um, of record taking um of you know in bite inferences tmj all of those things so what i would suggest if you're really into it is to do the smile dental academy postgrad diploma in aesthetic restorative dentistry again i am slightly biased because i teach three of the modules and lauren teaches one of them as well so i'm being biased but i did that postgrad diploma i absolutely loved every minute of it and I learned so much and now I'm really committed to teaching more therapists on there we've had an insane number of therapists go through that diploma already and really enjoy it so so jump on there and have a look okay um are the webinars on demand um on the Janus Davis website or, or the Ikigai so the one that Kat did for Janus Davis I would assume is on Janus Davis' website. <laughs> and then um, the Ikigai, NSK Ikigai ones. So this one tonight. And I think you did, have you done powder therapy as well? Therapy and ultrasonics. Well. Uh, yeah, they're all on, on Ikigai. Um, which brand of dental saw do you use? Just the one that, that my nurse gets out of the <laughs> cupboard. <laughs> That's that's um, very princess like of you uh, there, Kat. <laughs> what happens is you go, oh, um, I'm just going to try and get some floss in this bit, and the nurse goes, use this. Um. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So it, I think this is might be the same along the same lines. So is is the orthodontic so is it orthodontic saw? It's an orthodontic saw. Yes, yeah. that it is. Yeah, yeah. And the ones that are that we use in our practice are made by a company called Comet and I, but I can't remember if I remember I will post it on the hygiene and therapy forum I, it's then that's not the name of the company 
um, but if I do. And then someone said, thanks. And then um, somebody said, Kath, can we get Kat to come to Manchester, please? Always. I love Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> so whoever that is, um, find some people who want to do it and we'll, we'll arrange it. It's not a problem. Right. And I, I think... I think that's it I think that's insane think. number of questions <laughs> I know you did you did amazingly there Kat. honestly it was so informative I, I really really enjoyed it I mean obviously I'd seen it you had 34 questions insane <laughs> so that's that is absolutely fantastic um well done uh, any last words for our uh, audience um only You've got 75 yes. people <laughs> just to say of all of you that have joined the webinars we just so appreciate the time i know it's late I know you've been working hard. I know you're probably tired. It means so much to me and to Ikigai and everyone that's an edu Ikigai educator when you support us and you come mm -hmm. and join in and do the learning together. We really enjoy putting on these webinars. I love it. I know you do as well, Catherine. Yeah, and I do. Yeah. It's just so amazing to see so many hygienists and therapists who come together wanting to do the best for their patients. Um, so a huge a huge thank you to the audience um, that join us and we just appreciate you and please do get in contact if you want to chat to me if you want to um, you know ask any further questions if I've not covered something or you didn't feel like you could ask I'm around just pop me a message I'm always open to DM. DM. Brilliant that is great thank you so much and I, I echo everything Kat said I mean um, Ikigai at NSK the, the company are just so supportive of the profession and of training. So absolutely brilliant. Just to reiterate, um, today, tonight has been recorded. Um, it will go up onto uh, my NSK website um, around 10 days. And you should receive um, an email about feedback around sort of Monday, Tuesday next week. Maybe give it till Wednesday before you start hammering the door down, possibly. Um, and uh, if you fill in the form, feedback form, you will get your CPD certificate sent to you. Um, and yeah, fantastic. Uh, and I hope everybody has a lovely night. And uh, what's left of it now? <laughs> So thank okay. you so much for hosting me. Not uh, a problem at all. Thank you. And um, I'll speak to you soon. You certainly will. Take care. Bye. <laughs>